everybody, it's great to be back here again. It's Friday, Pashat Balotcha here in Israel. And to ask for your week behind us because of the holiday. And I'd like to open up this week's portion, this week's lesson, with a dream that I had. I literally woke up with these words on my mouth. And, I, and I'll tell you the dream and, and whatever, let me start with the dream. <laughs> so I was in this large room here and someone came over to me for assistance and I was able to help that person. Right away I ran to help the person and then I noticed standing next to me was this manager and I saw he was sad. And I realized, you know something, why is he sad for? Because why did that person turn to me and not turn to the manager? So I said, I said Mr. Manager, don't be sad. Um, it's like a, a general in the army. And he has a lot of soldiers, and he has small offices. They're not going to turn, the soldiers are not going to turn to the general. If they need something, they're going to turn to the little offices over there. And they're going to help them out. And when I woke up with those words of my breath, I had an epiphany right away. and said, what does this mean? I said, you know, so know what this means? This is that all of us, we are those simple office officers in the world. And when people need help, which is the most important thing in this world, to help others, we are representing the general. And who's the general, the creator of the universe? We're representing the creator of the universe. And that is really the deep message I saw in this dream, that everything is for God's glory. And when we do something for the right reasons, we're doing it for the sake of God, realizing that we're representing Him down here on this earth, Mother Earth, so we are expanding that glory, as it's bringing down the glory of the creator of the universe to this world. And that's really the deep message that I saw behind this dream. Now, it's so powerful how it connects to the book of Numbers that we're right now in the middle of. We just began um, the book of Numbers, and which is all about the clouds of glory. And if we look in this week's portion, there are many examples of this, and I just want to quickly bring down a couple of them. And one of them is if we look in, in, um, in chapter 9, and it talks about from verse number 15 to 23, it talks about it seems to be almost redundant how much the word cloud is mentioned. And if you read those verses, for again, from, from verse number 15 to 23, it literally goes over and over again. And it's describing how the cloud would hover over the tabernacle and, uh, and, and when the cloud would go away, and then um, afterwards Israel would travel, you know, travel had to tra go on the travelings, and then when the cloud would, would um, delay itself longer, on the tabernacle for many days, Israel would remain there and they wouldn't travel, and then it would go up, they would travel. <laughs> and it just keeps going back and forth discussing the clouds. And what is this cloud, this cloud is talking about? Well, this is the cloud of glory. And which is really very interesting is that the Torah, when it describes the appearance of the creator of the universe in this world, you know, through, we see it many times in the Torah, especially it began on Sinai with the cloud, God appearing in the cloud on Sinai, and it's the Kvod Hashem, the glory of God. And we see it throughout the tabernacle, as Nachmanani says, the tabernacle is a continuation of Sinai, that whole thing. And from the tabernacle, it moved over to the temple. That's where the, the divine presence resided in the temple, and the Holy of Holies more than any place. So we see that the constant, there's a constant over here, that when the Torah reveals the appearance of God is coming down, it's talking about it in the form of a cloud. Now, God forbid, we're not saying God is that cloud, because obviously God is something that's totally, we did not now grasp, we can't grasp the creator of the universe, but, he, but God, His glory, you know, we have, to, we have to understand, He created these clouds of glory as, a, as a, some kind of um, representative, or say a, uh, uh, what's it called, the word is like, in the Hebrew I'm looking for the good word, is kavod, right? Oh, um, kavod haniva, that's the expression brought down by our um, sages, kvod, honor that was created. In other words, a way that we could relate through the cloud. We know that the divine presence here is, 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 in a, is being um, enhanced, right? In this, in more than other places, because in reality, God's presence is all over the world. As we know, we read about in Isaiah, when the first um, prophetic ex um, experience that the prophet Isaiah has, he's, he's standing inside the temple and he, and then he describes how the angels, and they're saying, Kadosh, 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 right? Holy, holy, holy. Hashem Tzvako, the God of hosts. Melo kol aretz kvodo, the entire world fills, his honor fills the entire world. So we know, obviously, God's presence is all over the world. But in certain areas, it's more concentrated. We have to understand that. It's a very deep thing to understand. It's hard to grasp. But again, it's expressed through the Anan and through the cloud. And another place we can give an example 
in um, the book of Leviticus, right? When the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, it says, Be'anan e'ra'el kapot right? Through the cloud he would appear before the kapot, before the Ark of the Covenant. So again, the cloud always represents the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, that is being really hidden within the cloud, right? It's something that's in, in the layers of spirituality. And getting back to our portion, so I'm saying there's a lot of discussion here about clouds, and which is fascinating. And right, well, towards the end of the portion, and I'd like to quote another source of that, is brought out in chapter 11, in verse 24 to 29, it talks about a very interesting story where Moshe Rabbeinu, after the nation is asking for meat, and then he's, tells, he tell, he's complaining to God, he's saying, I can't deal with this nation, <laughs> you know, how can I deal with all this? And, and God says, okay, I want you to gather 70 elders and gather them around the tent. And, and then it says, and God came down in the cloud, right, and he brought part of the spirit of Moshe Rabbeinu, part of the, the, the spirit that was upon Moshe Rabbeinu, and he gave to the elders, and they began to prophesy. And if we, we followed the whole thing, um, Joshua, at the end of it, Joshua runs over and, and he says to Moshe Rabbeinu that these two individuals, Eldad and Medad, were continuing to prophesy. And Joshua would feel terrible about it. He goes, what's going on over here? How is this possible? You're the boss. You're the, you're the boss. Moshe Rabbeinu, you're the, you're the greatest prophet. How can it be that, that um, these two other individuals, they're like these small officers we spoke about before. How can it be that they're prophesizing? And Moshe Rabbeinu's answer is so profound and so beautiful to Joshua, who's going to be the next leader. And he says, Moshe says, are you jealous for me? Let it be that the entire nation of Israel will be prophets. And God should place His Spirit upon them. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu, would, that's the lesson that the epiphany I had. I, just, I found it here in the portions exactly what this deep lesson is all about is that it's not for the glory of, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, says, Moshe Rabbeinu was on this so high level, he knew what that meant. That everything in this world is for the honor of Hashem. All the great prophecy that Moshe Rabbeinu merited in achieving was only for the glory of Hashem and nothing else. And, and, and let it be that God's glory spread out, that, that everyone should be on that level and everyone should be prophesizing. Fascinating teaching and such an important lesson. And if we take that back to the clouds and, and what we talked about beforehand, if we see the beautiful dynamics in the, in the, in the desert, there's an expression brought, brought down by Jeremiah the prophet, and it says, <laughs> Israel is being complimented that the way to walk with God in a land that wasn't sown in the land, the desert represents the uncleanliness, the dangers of the desert. We know it's, it's a very, very, a lot of um, sources talk about what the desert represents. And here Israel's walking with God in the desert, and everything is so perfect, the harmony of spirituality and the nation working in a perfect, uni unified way, perfect harmony, where our clothes were given to us, and the water and the food from the heavens, and God guided us with the clouds and all this. Everything was in this perfect harmony within the desert. And that's really what our goal is to be reach in the future, that harmony. And, and here we see the clouds which led Israel and guiding Israel, is really this world, this world is where, where you know, the div divine presence, the word world in Hebrew, means lalim to hide. God's presence is hidden in this world. And when we're able to um, reveal the glory of God through everything we do, through all our travelings, through every um, activity we do in this world, we bring down the glory, we are, bring, we are, we are lifting up the cloud in a way, we are revealing Removing the veils, the the the, the, um, the um, you know the divisions that divide between the world and God. We want to reveal the creative universe to the world, and that's God's glory. God's glory is revealed when we're able to live a life of, of perfect unity with, within spirituality in the physical world, and that's really the lesson of of the tabernacle. And there's a beautiful midrash that talks about when the first man you know sinned, Adam Gishon, the first man. And every time he, he sinned, so the, there are seven firmaments, and the, and the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, was lifted up to another firmament. And after the, 
the, the generations continued to sin, they kept going up until they went all the way to seven different firmaments. And through Abraham, only when Abraham came about, it began to rectify, bringing down the divine presence again on earth. That's what happens when we are not walking with God and there is sin, there's division, there are clouds. We can't see the creator of the universe. The idea is to bring down the divine presence to this world for everyone to see the glory of God. And that's what Abraham was, began, when he began to bring down, the, um, again, bring down the Shekhinah, and it continued through the forefathers, which are the seven levels of the spheres, as we all know, and Moshe Rabbeinu merited bringing down the divine presence down again. And that's what we see here. The Midrash says, talks about that there are, there are, there are seven clouds of glory. The seven clouds of glory refer to the seven affirmants that they, that, that they went up. So now Moshe Rabbeinu had to bring down the divine presence on this world for everyone to see the glory of Hashem. That's really represents what will be in the future. What will be in when we reach our final destination in the tikkun olam rectifying the world where the divine presence will come down here and the clouds of glory will be touching us like just the beautiful dew just touching upon us and, and the divine presence will be shining in all its beautiful glory. And that really is a deep message here about this week's portion. Part of the, of the whole story of Numbers is how everything there was like this perfect, um, in the desert, this perfect, what's the word I'm looking for? A example of what's going to be in the future because here we are with the, with the center, the central point is the tabernacle and the divine presence hovering over that. And that is really what Moshe Rabbeinu built for Israel which will be revealed in the future as we reach our final, final goals. We said before, and we see this at the end of, of the book of Yechezkel HaNavi, Ezekiel the prophet, the last chapter of, of the prophet is 48, and he talks about, he says, the last two words of the portion is Hashem Shama. Jerusalem is going to be calling, God is there. It's not going to be a question anymore. Everyone is going to see Jerusalem and say right away, God is there. They're going to see the divine presence residing in the holy city of Jerusalem. And this is really what's happening today with all our struggles in the world and, and the nations against Israel and, and the things that go on here. But at the end, the glory of Hashem will shine in this, on the land of Israel and shine for the entire world. And they will see Hashem Shama. God is there. That will be clear to everybody. With all the difficult things that we've been going through, nothing's going to stop from the Divine Presence from, from residing in this world. And the way to do it, as I mentioned before, is we will realize we are all those simple officers, the simple sergeants that we are representing God in this world, and we have the ability to spread the word, the beautiful light of Hashem, by adhering to His Torah and building a beautiful country of Israel which will be a light to the nations. Shabbat Shalom, B'Sorot Avot, Yishuot, V'Nechamot.